Welcome back to the Journal Club of Justice, an online journal club made up of a small group of friends who meet once a month to praise, scrutinize, and discuss research of the physical therapy nature, one article at a time. Could be new, could be old, but we feel it will create a good discussion that will influence our practice. We hope that you will get as much out of this as we do. We do ask you keep in mind new research is always coming out and progressing, so do not take any of what we say as medical advice, facts, or clinical suggestion. All right, welcome internet viewers. This is the Journal Club of Justice, episode seven. Um, really cool episode today and really important, all about you know imaging, uh, specifically MRI in regards to disc degeneration. Um, you know, just about every patient, well, probably not every patient, but a majority of our patients come to see us have had some sort of image. And so it's important to know know what is relevant what is irrelevant um, as well as know you know how to kind of navigate that conversation when patients ask do I need an x-ray MRI etc um, because they are you know not exactly efficient because you got to make an appointment and then you got to wait and you know wait maybe a few days for results you know they're very expensive and sometimes they don't even change how we would necessarily treat anybody um, so without further ado, let's kind of dive in here. This week or this month's article is MRI findings of disc degeneration are more prevalent in adults with low back pain than in asymptomatic controls. A systematic review and meta-analysis. Uh, lead author is W. Brinjikinji. I promise I've been practicing this name. Still can't say it. Um, it was published in... 2015 in the American Journal of Neuroradiology. All right. Did anything stand out for you guys? You're like, wow, that was really eye-opening. Um, for me, I was looking at the chart and um, the prevalence, or prevalence, I should say. Um, and I was kind of surprised by the difference between symptomatic and asymptomatic because I feel like I've always heard, you know, about, for certain I was thinking about 50%, about 50% of people that are asymptomatic have, like, disc changes as well. And it doesn't, in this study, it didn't show to be like that. But I also was kind of questioning because 39% of the population was asymptomatic, whereas 61% was symptomatic in this study. So I feel like it would have been better if it was like 50 50. Yeah. yeah yeah I found I mean just just from the title I was you know I did not expect you know knowing what we know from previous work um, a lot from the same group as well as just a lot of the information that gets floated around on social media that they did find um, that the symptomatic individuals had more, um, what did I write a lot as, yeah, some, some sort of disc degeneration. But, you know, it's important to kind of, you know, looking at this uh, chart here, you know, it's important to see that a lot of that is in, you know, the, the fissures, the high intensity zones of the spinal canal stenosis, stuff that really does relate to, you know, symptoms because it's kind of serious when that's going on. Yeah. So I did, so I was looking for, what was I looking for? I was looking for something when I was making the infographic, which is yet to be posted uh, for this article and found another article by the same group, which looks very, very similar to this, but it's just the systematic review. It's the same in, and so I don't know if this is the same data points or if it's something totally different because it came out just earlier in the same year. Um, and they found a lot, so this bulge prevalence increased from 30% of those in 20 years of age to 84% of those 80 years of age or older. So that's more in lines with what I 
thought we were going to find here. But that one came out earlier? Yeah, in April. Oh. And this one that we're reviewing here was in, where did that say? I want to say it was like December or something. Yeah. Oh, September. And it had the exact same in? It's pretty close. 3,110. I think ours had 3,097. Mm -hmm. But so the one we're reviewing here had they only looked at those 50 and younger. This one included those over the age of 80. Um, so that may be a difference there. Is what I found interesting the discussion that they mentioned, although it only included three studies when they did the meta-analysis for the disc bulge, but when it was symptomatic, it was in those that were younger rather than older. And so in this slightly older paper where they included more of those older individuals, maybe that's what made that non-significant at that point. Which what I also thought was, you know, what came to mind when I read that was, um, and I'm not sure exactly where it's from. I couldn't find it exactly, but it's a, a graph where over time, our the findings of arthritis in the lumbar spine, you know, go up like this as we age. Mm -hmm. But those complaining of back pain kind of go like this. So it's when you're younger, kind of like middle age, that you're complaining a lot of back pain and then you know nobody's really complaining about it or reporting it at least um, as they age so that kind of brings in you know it's it's more than whatever your image is saying you know at that point in time because uh, that's just a snapshot of your anatomy at that point in time so you know to pose a question to you guys how do you navigate that conversation with the patient when they come in? Well, I have back pain because I have this bulging disc that was found in my MRI. Um, let's just say I love, I love right now I have a patient that says, the reason it's not low back pain, it's neck pain, but every time I see him, he tells me, I'm having that pain because it's just slipped out of place again. It's just slipping out of place every time. <laughs> He's like, once it slips back in, it makes me feel better. And I tried educating him on the anatomy, I sent him the spine. And I'm like, it just doesn't just slip right in and out like that. Like, it doesn't, it's not how it works. But somewhere he got imaging done. And he, from what the doctor told him, he's taking it as there's something slipping in and out of place that's causing all of his pain. So a lot of it's patient education. Sometimes patients just don't understand. Um, but... The patients that do understand and that have, they like come in, they say, you know, I had imaging done. It shows I have a disc bulge. But like, I don't understand how physical therapy is going to help help with this. And then I kind of just talk about, you know, I, I go a couple of different routes treating people with low back pain. I see if they respond to movement-based flexion or extension. Um, I also go based on if they have like excessive anterior pelvic tilt, weak core, and I'll treat that way. Sometimes I do a combination of both. Um, but the people that respond well to extension, I kind of explain to them, because it's kind of like McKinsey model, from what I've had people tr train me about McKinsey, you know, doing the extension um, can kind of pinch it off, I guess you can say, and then the fluid eats it up. Um, and it just, it's, it's what happens with the body. So some people are like, okay, yeah, the extension makes me feel better, let's just keep doing that, and then they respond well. But I think it's the people that don't understand what's going on and they really think it's all due um, to that bulge and they don't think therapy is going to help, then they're not going to get better because they're not going to go home and do their exercises. And I think those people think that right away that they need surgery. Yeah, definitely. But, um, to add on to that, I like to, you know, ask people, did they have their MRI in the morning? Yes, because that's when they schedule them. Were you laying down? Yes because that's how they do it. Well, we have, well, what we know is that you have 
you have more disc bulges in the morning when your discs are really hydrated and you have them more when you're laying down as opposed to standing up. So um, I think it's some work by Adrian Lowe. Give somebody an MRI when they're laying down, they got, you know, however many bulges, whatever, stand them up and now they have a lot less bulges or none at all. Um, so that's, you know, that's really eye opening that, you know, maybe the bulge is not directly related to what my symptoms are. And specific to your neck patient, April, um, I don't know if you saw the infographic uh, from abnormal findings on MRI of the C-spine and about 1,200 patients. Infographic we did just, a, I don't know, a couple weeks ago or so. Well, I like I saw a lot. Yeah, you should check that one out. 87.6% of those had a disc bulge. They were all asymptomatic people. Holy cow. <laughs> what was the age group? Do you remember? Uh, between 20 and 70. And they had about 100 people per decade. Okay. Wow. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah, I was glad I glad I found that one as well as you know the one we're reviewing here. Uh -huh. Because some of these others that I found only had a small N. It'd be like fifty people, which makes sense, I guess, for a study like this because MRIs are expensive uh, and trying to find people, I guess, to do that um, was challenging. I don't know, but. Yeah, I was glad to find some with a really high end, give us some a little bit more reasonable results to go off of. Yeah. Do any of your low back pain ever complain more of their legs than the actual back whenever they come in with a disc MRI? I don't know that I can think of any specific example, but it, I feel like I've heard that. Um, or, <clears throat> or what I get is I have this sciatica, and I think it's from this disc bulge from an MRI that I had 10 years ago. Yep. Like, that's interesting. You know that discs heal, right? No, I didn't know that. Okay. So then we kind of go down that discussion. Um, and a lot of times, it, you know, I will find that it's maybe more neural tension, more um, kind of just neural sensitivity that was never really addressed. Um, so yeah, that's what, that's kind of more the route that I go there that, you know, I just try to take everything away from the back at that point and just, like we're gonna work on your neural sensitivity, get you back to function, kind of work on the symptoms, but get you feeling better, and just try to really downplay the disc thing. Yeah. A lot of, for me, Nicole, um, I really typically don't ask a whole lot about imaging because I feel like patients then think, I mean, they over they overthink it. And so I will look up in their chart if they were a patient at our hospital, look up in our chart and see if they had imaging, just read it real quick. And then I typically don't even ask them unless they're coming from an outside provider. Um, but lately I really haven't had much um, like symptoms into the leg. Most of mine's been central low back pain. And a lot of mine recently just have been um, overweight, anterior pelvic tilt or posture, and they just need more stabilization so a lot of patients recently i've been doing that and i i mean i've just charged several in the past couple of weeks i only saw three or four weeks and they've had but I've, yeah with the radiating pain i actually haven't seen a lot probably in the past few months with that i do have an interesting um sorry adam were you gonna say uh, something no go ahead go ahead uh, I did have a patient who was um, 
high school athlete and he was having some severe pain, um, football, wrestling, and he would come in, his pain was always around an eight out of 10. And he had this going on for a couple years. And therapy, he would feel better afterwards. After a 30 minute session, his pain would go down to between a t zero to two from an eight. And then he'd walk out to his car and then within 10, 15 minutes of therapy, his pain would be right back up to an eight. So he ended up getting imaging done and had a PARS-1 defect. Um, so that was very interesting. I'm like, cause at first he was responding well to extension and he shouldn't be doing extension with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he was responding well to flat to extension. wasn't having any pain. And then I said, you know, after like three to four weeks, I'm like, you're, your pain's only staying gone for 10 to 15 minutes. So I sent him back to the doctor and he had imaging done and it showed that. And he had a, the re, he didn't get a report of the imaging yet and I had it. And so I said, you know, let's just stop the extension based exercises right now. <laughs> and I was like, let's get you back into the doctor. <laughs> so let's just put therapy on hold until you see the doctor again. But then he saw the doctor again and had him come back to therapy. And then we, stopped with the extension based exercises and just did more core stabilization um but that was one time where i was like okay imaging's we definitely need imaging for this kid and i was glad we got it because we were doing something we shouldn't have been doing but. yeah that's crazy but i mean that's a perfect example of when imaging is probably indicated and when it is very beneficial to have that um because it's not you know we like to you know kind of put a lot of, you know, de-emphasis on imaging, but sometimes it's really makes a difference and it, it's a really incredible tool. So April, I'm, I'm curious on your thoughts on core stabilization and why that works. Wait, wait, say that. Uh, did you mute? You're muted. Sorry, my mom was calling me. Okay. What did you say, Adam? Um, your thoughts on core stabilization and why it works, why you choose that, et cetera. So, back pain patients. Yep. So, um, I really don't, can't tell you specifics like pathophysiology, why I think it really works, but a lot of my patients lately, that's what I've been doing with them. Um, most of them I haven't even been doing flexion or extension based because they didn't really seem, seem to respond. Um, I guess a couple of them I did do kind of flexion based because they, we were doing some piriformis stretching, things like that, some knees to the chest, lumbar trunk rotation. Um, but a lot of the people I've seen lately that have, one of the scripts was obesity that I received. I'm like, okay, what's going on with this patient? besides obesity. So that meant he was really for low back pain. Um, but just overweight, they don't know how to activate those core muscles. And so I've been teaching them a lot of, you know, stabilization when lifting, proper lifting techniques, um, keeping that core tight when just standing there doing dishes. Um, sometimes I have them do like a TA brace or sometimes post your public till if they can't do a TA brace when they're wash one dish, do it, take a break, then wash another one do it again make it more like functional but a lot of my patients lately have been seeing improvements with that um my thing is i don't really care i don't know if i should say that but i don't really care what the pathophysiology behind it is if they're getting better so if it's flexion or extension based if it's core stabilization as long as they're showing improvements i'm happy fair enough very very symptom driven um I just bring that up because, let's see, Lorimer, I got to learn how to say names, Lorimer Mosley, are you familiar with them? Yeah, yep. Mm -hmm. um, big pain researcher, Should, he has a study out where they took this girl, had like chronic low back pain, gave her, you know, like pelvic tilts for a week and like put her in an MRI do a pelvic tilt, brain like lights up, and then do pelvic tilts for a week, did another MRI, and compared, 
compared to two in the brain activity. And there's less brain activity, which doesn't exactly mean less pain, but sort of um, in a very gross kind of understanding. <laughs> then they gave her a session of like the pain neuroscience stuff. Mm -hmm. Brought her back, just one session, brought her back to the MRI and there's like almost nothing lit up doing the same pelvic tilt. It, you know, so know, it's just crazy what, you know, that understanding of pain does for people. Um, I, I totally agree. You know, Adrian Lowe's books, like, why do I have pain? I yeah. have, why is my pelvis hurt? I have those in the clinic and I give them to my patients, the ones I can trust to bring them back to me. And they come back and they're like, that makes so much more sense. Like I had a stressful weekend, you know, with my partner or with work. And I, now I understand why I'm in more pain after those events. So I think, yeah, I think the science, neuroscience, pain neuroscience is extremely important. Yeah. That's really interesting. When was that study done, Adam? 2005. 2005, okay. Yeah. Do you do court? What do you typically we do with your low back pain patients? School yet. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't hear about this until after school. Stupid. Yeah. Well, we didn't talk about pain neuroscience much in school. I feel like that needs to be a class. Mm -hmm. Should be. Yeah. I mean, why, yeah. why are people coming to see us? Because they're in pain. Wouldn't it make yeah. sense that we know a little bit of something about pain? <laughs> it would make sense. <laughs> Adam, so what do you do with most of your low back pain patients? We do a lot of, well, a lot of education. And then we do a lot of movement. You know, I'm, I'm very big into like neural glides and trying to just decrease the sensitivity of the nervous system. Um, so whether that's, you know, I had one patient recently, well, she wasn't, I was seeing her that day. She wasn't my patient. She's one of my coworkers. She just came in. She's like, I'm just really anxious and so stressed and this and that and haven't had time to do the exercises. I'm kind of stressed about that. And I'm like, look, let's just go into the private room. Let's do some deep breathing. Here's a hot pack. 10 minutes. Here's a bell. Let me know if you it gets like too hot or you know whatever you need something. Came back. She walked out and she's like, "Thank you." I was like, "You're welcome." I guess I I didn't do anything. <laughs> you know, yeah. You just, like made time for yourself to just kind of like de-stress and just breathe for a minute, and you know that really just took her pain, her anxiety, just everything just came way down from that. Um. I really don't do that that much, um, but you know, I, what's that? I say like, I actually, um, well, since I see public pain so much too, and I've been, now that I've been working for about a year now and I'm seeing a lot more pelvic patients, um, I've realized even with my outpatient ortho patients with hip pain, back pain, I'm asking a lot more about pelvic pain too, and a lot of them have pelvic pain that nobody's asked them about or they're just scared to say something because they don't think it's related. So um, I, ha I just discharged a, pa a lady who was coming in for back and um, like hip and thigh pain and found out she's been having a lot of groin pain for her whole life, um, which the first month I was seeing her, I didn't ask about that. So then we started incorporating a lot more deep breathing. I had, I actually play meditation music on my laptop lab top at work i'll just shut the door meditation music we do our deep breathing we'll do like our butterfly stretch happy baby stretch um things like that and it i mean people respond really well to that because a lot of people's lives are just so hectic and crazy they don't make time for themselves so i think that's really good that you incorporated that yeah for sure it's just recognizing when there's more to the equation than just your typical ortho presentation you know, move, strengthen this, move that, stretch that kind of thing. Um, and when it's maybe a little bit more 
you know, psychosomatic, bring in that, that psychosocial component to the biopsychosocial model. Nicole, have you seen many patients with back pain yet? Uh, yeah, that's one of the ones I've seen a lot of. I have someone who just got an injection too. Like they had gotten it before they came to me and now they have no back pain, but their leg is like shot. Um, but I've done the same thing you guys have done where sometimes if it's like chronic multiple years before they get there, I think it's more of talking about their life than so much the movement, especially if they've, like I have someone who came in and they've already figured out what they can do to make the pain go away, but it just keeps coming back and it always comes back whenever there's a big change in work or something else like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Hey Adam, you should yeah. do some of your, do some videos. Um, maybe you already have of your like nerve glides and nerve mobility you're doing with your low back pain patients. So I'd love to see those. Okay. Okay. I can maybe do that. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe we could do something on the journal club like that. That I think that's actually one of the months that I have planned. I'm pretty sure is neuromobilization. Awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'll see what I can do. Okay. No, I, ha I have noticing. at least I have at least one. Oh, uh, I ISPI site. They have a lot of good uh, resources. They have you know media nerve glides, radial nerve glides, ulnar, sciatic, um, all with PDS. Different you know um, I guess you could say levels. Really, it's just it's almost kind of getting creative with them. Is it ISPS? You said ISPI. International oh, Spine and Pain Institute, I believe. Okay. And they also have they also have um, what I what I go to a lot is when I'm doing some of the P and E education. They have wording that you can use. They have a document with all the wording that you can use and put into your assessment. Just so you can just copy and paste, and it's super easy. Oh, awesome. So anything else uh, regarding the article that you guys felt pretty pertinent about or anything like that? That was a poorly worded question. <laughs> no, okay. Nothing I can really think of. Not, not the, like the little notes or anything I took. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight, you know, one of the limitations they mentioned <clears throat> is that, you know, in all the, the studies they were looking at, uh, back pain was defined very broadly, including axial, sciatica, and radicular pain. Mm, yeah. I mean, that, that's going to kind of influence, you know, their findings of the, for those symptomatic individuals. Um, cause there's a lot included in that, you know, and, and if you're a little more specific or looking at one type, maybe that association of their, it being there in symptomatic individuals versus asymptomatic maybe wouldn't be there. Uh, if you narrowed it down as opposed to lumping it kind of all together. Yeah. Um, one other thing that I kind of caught as I like, um, or it says in the discussion, disc de degeneration also has a very high prevalence in asymptomatic individuals, ranging from 30 to 95%, <laughs> depending on the age group. And then it like cites 14 different studies. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big difference. It is. It is, but it's, you know, I think the older we get, the more it shows up and, yeah, you know, it's kind of like I've, I saw some from uh, Dr. Jared Hall recently. He's a really good follow on Instagram. If you don't follow him already or, or seen some of his work on the TPT student page, What's his um, name? Jared Hall. Okay. 
Um, he was comparing, I think, degenerative changes to other things that we don't think twice about, such as uh, wrinkles. You know, you just, older people, you know, you just get wrinkles and it's no big deal. It just happens. You know, a lot of this stuff that we found in images are kind of the same concept, but it's on the inside. It's like wrinkles on the inside. You know, it, not yeah. necessarily meaningful. Uh, it's just, it's just how it is. Just there, normal changes that happen with age. Which I, I thought was a great way to put it, because you know people can relate to that and understand what that kind of means. I don't really have anything else, Adam. Yeah. Yeah, I was trying to look for something. I know there there was one statement somewhere in here. Something about um, the degenerative changes aren't necessarily always a pain generator, and so you gotta you gotta kind of look look beyond the image. I can't find where it said that now, or maybe that was a different study. Um, but e even though they found an association with it being more prevalent in symptomatic individuals these changes are still there in asymptomatic people. So, you know, you gotta look, you gotta look beyond the image, you gotta look beyond the diagnosis and, you know, recognize you're treating a human, not the diagnosis, not the image, and everything that comes along with that and the, the psychosocial aspects. So, if there's nothing else we need to mention, um, again, this paper uh, was titled MRI findings of disc degeneration are more prevalent in adults with low back pain than in asymptomatic controls, a systematic review and meta-analysis. Lead author was Brent Brinjit Kinji, um, published in 2015 of the American Journal of Neuroradiology. If you guys have any suggestions, topics that you want us to cover, we'd love our opinions on, et cetera, uh, please email us, uh, direct message us, you know, get in contact with, with us in some way. Uh, oh my gosh, we didn't, we didn't introduce Nicole. <laughs> All right, so guys, if you're still watching, you're wondering who is this girl uh, that's a new face? This is Dr. Nicole Kalt Wasser. Uh, she is a year younger than April and I. Um, just graduated from Maryville. Uh, anything else significant to add, Nicole? No, not really. Okay, not yet at least. <laughs> Things to come. Um, and then, as always, this is, or not always, but when she's available, uh, Dr. April Wit Witz. Ritz. Oh my gosh. Rough morning. <laughs> I am uh, Dr. Adam Schwartz of Run Mental, and this is the Journal Club of Justice signing out.